Shane Lee, and they are from PEXA. And they're going to be talking to us today about modernizing uh, development using an API first uh, based approach and the lessons they have learned uh, within uh, PEXA. So if you'd like to welcome to the stage, uh, if we have them now available, yep, they're coming on now. Please give a warm welcome to Dean Baker and Shane Lee. And again, um, we can have interactive questions at the end. So feel free to uh, add your questions into the chat um, during the presentation. And I will uh, relay the questions at the end. Um, over to you, Dean and Shane. Awesome. Thanks, Ian. Uh, and look, we, we really, we're really happy to be here with you all and, and really appreciate the opportunity to come in and, and share some some of the, the lessons that we've had on, on our journey um, bringing an API first strategy um, into PEXA. So I, I guess we'll start um, a little bit about myself. Uh, my name is Dean Baker. I've been with PEXA for uh, just about two years now. I'm really interested in our technology, our tool sets, ways of working. Um, learning and development is, is a real passion of mine. And in this talk, I'm going to talk uh, about um, our ways of working and how we've sort of evolved that um, in this journey. And we have Shane. Yes, yeah, so hi all. My name is Shane Lee. I'm staff engineer at PEXA. So I've been with PEXA just over a year now. So primarily spearheading the, the API first initiative. Fantastic. All right. So the agenda for today, um, we're going to talk a, a bit about our API history and our ways of working and, and how that has changed a little bit over time. Um, the execution um, of, of what we've done. So Shane's going to delve into that in, in a lot more detail. And then we're going to wrap up with some, some reflections and some thoughts and would really love to hear any questions or, or insights that you guys uh, might have had in similar, in similar journeys. All right, so a little bit about PEXA, I suppose. Um, if you guys haven't heard of us, um, you know, if you have bought or sold a house in the last few years, chances are that transaction has gone through PEXA. So we've spent around about 10 years um, really trying to bring that property exchange world into the digital world. Um, so, you know, looking at creating less paperwork, um, reducing process time and, and reducing that margin for error. So to put that into perspective, I suppose, it was only a few years ago where folks would actually meet uh, in a time and a place, uh, in a room, swapping checks, signing bits of paper, and that's how, that's how you'd settle, right? And, and these folks would go from room to room um, throughout the day settling properties for people. Um, these days, uh, through the PEXA platform, you can, you can do that at home on, on, you know, in the comfort of your, of your COVID couch. No need to go to a settlement room. So that's, that's fantastic. So um, as we say, we have been building for around about 10 years. Um, so anyone working in software for, for that amount of time would probably recognize the architecture of something around about this age. So that close coupling of server and UI componentry, um, and of course we have APIs, but perhaps not in, um, in the early days, not how we think of APIs today. So 2014 saw our first real public API come about and, and this API was really designed with a single customer in mind, um, highly driven by what the customer's needs were right away, um, with a focus, I suppose, of getting those integrators on board and, and getting our platform rolling and you know, getting that critical mass of customers. 2017 saw us introduce um, Swagger into our ecosystem. So that's seeing us uh, become much, much better at engineer-friendly documentation um, and, and moving the needle on that developer experience. Uh, 2019, the developer portal comes about, um, and this is us really trying to shift that burden of support, I suppose, off of off of our teams and back onto the user. So moving towards a more of a self-service model, exposing our swagger in a portal, um, much, much more rich documentation, um, code samples, code starter packs, um, just a, a great place, a great resource for, resources for people to get on board and, and start the journey. And then in 2020 is when our API first journey um, really began. So ways of working. Um, often when you start on something like an API first journey, you, you know, you have teams that are already executing really, really well um, already. So we have these existing teams, these cross-functional teams, you know, they're working from, you know, from web to service to, to database. And these teams are really able to get 
our features to market incredibly quickly. So this is our this is our core exchange platform, and these teams very delivery focused. Um, they are cross functional, and and I suppose you could call them um, sort of BAU. Um, when we get to an API mindset in, in the early days, I think what we what we created was what I like to call a tiger team. And that tiger team is distinct from those streamlined teams. And again, that blatant team topologies reference. Um, we wanted to sort of protect those streamlined teams from the API work. So the streamlined team, uh, so the dedicated API team is that formation of experts to drive the outcome. Um, they can keep as close to the customer as possible. And I think when, when we introduce these tiger teams or these um, functionally, functionally aligned teams, they're really there to work independently of that delivery pressure. So the streamlined teams can go ahead and just do what they do. The dedicated API team um, trailblazes those APIs and can do that distinct of that delivery pressure, which can be um, quite compelling. From a short-term perspective, that, that's fantastic, and, and that team can really do a lot of great work. But ultimately, as we get bigger and bigger, and as we have more and more APIs across many domains, we, we get this, um, this problem of those teams relying on those streamlined teams or those domain-driven teams to really figure out that domain so they can expose those APIs. And we run into this problem um, of, of cognitive load. And, and this is where we really start to um, see how these tiger teams can start to take a bit of a hit. So what do I mean by that? I mean, um, the domain knowledge becomes a, a bit of a problem for us. So this functional team, this tiger team needs to know about domain A, B, C, all the way down to Z to be able to expose those APIs, right? So they have to be across everything. Um, and in that, there's a lot of context switching. So anyone in the room who's ever, you know, been asked to look at domain A, then switch to domain B, and you know, there's a defect on domain C, and you know, the 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 pain of that, the pain of context switching, and the time it takes to ramp up again is incredibly high, and it can be, uh, it, it puts a, a lot of load on these teams. Prioritization can become an issue again, as we say, we've got a new API for domain A, we've got you know, an enhancement for domain B, and we've got a bug in domain C. How do we how do we juggle that as a, as a single team, functional team? Um, at Pexa, we do like to be um, as cross-functional and as build and run as possible. So support can start to become an issue as we reach that critical mass of APIs. So customer support, onboarding support, um, onboarding um, technical people onto our platform, the technical support that comes with that, that all sort of lands back on that team. And really, I suppose, for me, as, as our API ecosystem grows, these functional teams, these API-centric teams start to break down. And I think it's a little bit unfair to, to really put all that all that load on them. So what, what have we done sort of moving forward with API first? <clears throat> Again, another blatant team topologies reference, um, the, the idea of this enabling team. And if, if you guys haven't had a crack at the team topologies book, I highly recommend it. It's a great way to start framing how you're thinking about your teams and, and interactions. But this, this enabling team, um, they're here to help these streamlined teams acquire those missing capabilities. So the focus here for us is really around developer experience, um, documenting guidelines and guardrails. How do, we, how do we ensure that the teams are on, on the right path, that standardization piece? Um, and above all, really empowering and uplifting those teams and learning and development becomes a, a really big part of the, this team's mandate. So how we do that? Um, pairing with teams is, is a really great start. So we love to, to get in there and embed with these teams and make sure that we're, we're doing the right things. Um, definitely beware the ivory tower. So we don't want this team to be, you know, just handing down standards and guardrails and ways of working without actually doing it them, themselves. So. By that, I mean, we need to get in there, show what good looks like, um, focus on this and, and focus on, um, you know, production APIs um, as well as just the, um, you know, the guardrails, guardrails and, and guidelines. Um, zero tolerance for debt. Um, when you have a, a enabling team or a center of excellence that are laying down these guardrails for other people to follow, we need to make sure that we don't introduce debt because 
if we do at, at the very beginning, um, as we federate out and as these streamlined teams pick more and more of this work up, that debt just accumulates and, and it's really hard to rein back in. So on that, it's important to, to deliver. Um, so don't be the ivory tower, but we can't be delivery centric. So we do have to take a little bit more time to deliver just to make sure we, we get things right. So when we federate out, um, we, we do the right thing. And, and to be honest, one of the lessons we learned is, you know, perhaps we did throw a little bit too much work to the enabling team and we did ask them to deliver probably a little bit more than they should have. And that, that did cause a, a little bit of tension. And also, you know, as an enabling team, your customers are the other teams. So again, yes, we're doing production APIs, but really the developer experience, right? How do we uplift the devs? How do we make sure that we're doing, doing the right thing? So the customers of the API of the enabling team, sorry, are the, the other teams. Ultimately, we want to get to a point where that, um, that functional team, that tiger team can dissolve. And by that, I don't mean firing everyone on the team. I mean, pivoting that team so that they're less uh, delivery centric and they're more, um, you know, rolling into that COE. So they're looking at those, those asynchronous APIs that are coming in the future, the, the streaming APIs events, um, more setting up other teams for success and less just, just punching out APIs. All right, so uh, the enabling team, we, we went on a bit of a roadshow and um, I guess we had three um, major focus points to try and get us on, on this API first journey. The first one was um, really that overall socialization of API first and its benefits. So this is us presenting it out all hands, um, socializing what the terminology is and, and trying to get that broad messaging out across, across the business. Um, outside of that, we, we split up into a, probably a two prong sort of attack where we hit the product owners and BAs. So how to think of APIs as a product, how to analyze APIs, some governance, and, and how that, that sort of shapes up. Then our engineers, um, much, much easier for Shane and I to hit. So much more hands-on, um, you know, showcasing the DX, the developer experience, the tooling, um, you know, workshops, blogging, that, that kind of stuff. And Shane's going to going to delve much, much deeper there. Uh, important lesson for us. And look, we were pretty chuffed with the roadshow. Um, we thought we did a pretty good job presenting and we thought we did a pretty good job shaping that messaging, depending on who we were speaking to, like BAs versus devs and, and so on. But um, but look, just presenting and going on that roadshow does not equal uptake. And a big lesson for us, um, you, you, we're only going to see uptake once the rubber hits the road. So driving much, much harder down through product and, and delivery to ensure that this API first stuff was getting into people's backlogs. You know, um, teams will just naturally do what they do um, unless you put, put quite a quite a hard hard force on them. So um, I think next we're going to talk a bit, bit about execution. So I'm going to hand over to Shane. Thanks, Dean. Yeah, so in general at PEXA, we do try <laughs> to encourage a culture of documentation and reduce that key man risk. So just over a year ago, we actually decided to introduce the RFC process, which is request for comments. So this actually allows you to facilitate agreements on an approach implementation. So if you think about proposing any large changes, so the likes of Spotify, Facebook, GitHub use this approach as well. So as you can guess, the first RC that we actually introduced was API guidelines. So one of the best ways to keep focus is to point back to ratify documentation. So once we actually publish the RC, any changes must go through a change process. And this actually stops a lot of those inane conversations and any ad hoc meetings. So the RC process allows any engineer willing to contribute and have their say, so skin in the game, so to speak. So I actually received feedback quite recently from a BA at PEXA designing APIs for Salesforce integration. And he actually said the guidelines was a breeze to follow. So whether it's naming conventions, HP statuses, error structures, pagination, it was all there. And I would actually adopt a similar approach if I was looking at other interfaces such as events or GraphQL, for example. So it's all about striking that balance of centralized governance and federation, as Dean said. So this comes back to the maturity in your organization. So you just have to remain patient that Rome wasn't built in a day. 
Um, so dog fooding, um, you guys might have heard about this before. So effectively, it's a practice of using one's own products or services. So Dean mentioned earlier about the enabling team. So the need to not only talk the talk, they need to walk the walk. So I work quite heavily with this team to def define best practices, patterns, tooling around APIs. So they must be using the tools that they're evangelizing. So the team was actually able to iron out any issues with the tooling and pave the way for other delivery teams to get up to speed quite easily and efficiently. And so there's ongoing meetings, workshops, and Slack channels to help empower the teams on their journey. So this helped drive good behaviors or herding the cats, so to speak, and actually reduce any ambiguity. So as mentioned in the previous slide, we do actually encourage a culture of documentation of PEXA. So the team is actually able to document the required steps along the API lifecycle with relevant blog posts and readmes. So one of the lessons learned was at the beginning of PEXA, there was a bit of the not invented here attitude and used to the status quo. But actually over time with the help of this enablement team and paving the way eating their own dog food, those perceptions changed and we actually noticed higher traction and buy-in from the business and engineers. So in relation to the API first life cycle, you can break it down into three main phases, which is design, implement, and validate. So the design is the most crucial initial phase. So this is your continuous discovery, ideation, problem solving. So it's about figuring out your domain and who's going to be consuming your APIs. So once you decide on that, you actually look at designing your API spec and making sure that it adheres to the API guidelines. We actually also have a development portal at PEXA for our external facing APIs. So along with internal stakeholders, we also provide a draft of our API spec to partners. So this feedback is actually critical in validating that the API solves the problem it's supposed to solve, as well as help us understand the aspects of our API that needs improvement. So by seeking this feedback before we write any code, we can actually quickly iterate the API design and build a much better API. So it's that saying of measure twice, cut once, so to speak. So I actually find you can gain a higher adoption, this approach by engaging partners early in the life cycle. And then just finally in the design phase and beta testing that this is something that we're going to look at in the future where we can identify any issues before public release. So when we talk about product design and UI, a lot of companies actually have um, design systems, component libraries, use a lot of tools like Envision and Figma. So why can't APIs be treated as first-class citizens as well? So then in relation to the implement phase, this is the fun part, I guess, for engineers. So we actually use Open API Generator quite heavily. And this actually allows us to generate the server stubs of the Open API spec. So this actually helps engineers because it reduces a lot of the boilerplate code. So then they can just start focusing on the actual business logic itself. And we're actually currently evaluating API management platforms at the moment. So we're speaking with multiple vendors. And once we actually agree on a product, we will be looking at adopting an API ops approach. And then finally, when it comes to validate, there's actually a really cool tool called Spectral from Stoplight. So we can actually define our own custom rule set that aligns with the API guidelines. So as part of our CI pipeline, anytime that we push the change to the open API spec, which is our source of truth, we can actually validate to make sure that it aligns with our API guidelines. And then in relation to shifting testing left with our QAs, we actually look at reducing that ice cream anti-pattern, so very heavy and manual end-to-end -end testing. So we try and shift left and focus on integration testing our APIs and using test containers. And then just finally, just briefly on open source. So like in any organization, PEXA heavily uses open source projects and libraries to extend our platforms to their fullest potential. Uh, so one of those libraries is Open API Generator. So you can see the CLI, even just for Docker alone, actually has over 10 million um, downloads. So I'm actually proud to announce that PEXA has become a bronze sponsor of Open API Generator, which we actually use heavily as part of our API first approach. And sometimes we actually forget that these open source projects are maintained by developers globally in their spare time. So this actually gives contributors the help and recognition that they deserve. Fantastic, thanks. Thanks, Shane. Um, <clears throat> so just wrapping up, I guess some of the key lessons for us, um, really, you know, those Tiger and functional teams, they're, they're a great start and, and they can really get you going 
quite quickly and, and it's, a, it's a good sort of safe thing to do. But ultimately, once we get to that uh, critical mass of APIs, we, we do need to start to embed and evangelize to succeed. And that's where we, we start to bring in those enabling teams to make sure that we can uplift everyone. Um, engaging hev heavily with product and delivery um, to align and uplift teams. So that's getting involved uh, in you know, sprint planning, making sure that we're doing the right things and, and trying to change how our, um, our, our POs and PMs um, sort of work. That living documentation is really vital. Um, so we don't want to ivory tower things. We want to make things as open as possible for everyone to contribute. Um, and as Shane sort of said, you know, skin in the game is incredibly important um, to make sure that developers feel that they can they can own a bit of it and, and they can invoke that change. And you know, when you're dealing with developers and you're de de dealing with change, that smooth developer experience is a must. You have to pave that road. Um, some devs can be um, you know can be quite picky on how they work and. We need to make that, that DX as, as smooth as possible. Um, and I suppose the mantra for me um, throughout our API first journey is, you know, we really do have to go slow to go fast. We, we have to take that step back um, and, and analyze what we want to do, wh where we want to head, you know, APIs as a product. You know, we're not just doing once-off APIs anymore, right? We, we want to create this suite. Um, so, so take a bit of a step back, go slow, um, tool up the team, and then eventually you're going to you're going to hit that hockey stick of um, you know everyone getting involved and and it's just a part of their BAU right and APIs are now just part of part of BAU. All right, and so I suppose next steps for us, um, look API first has really given us clarity on our domains, and I suppose when I talk about API first, we're, we're really talking about um, contract first. So the um, that's led us to think harder on our team structure and alignment. When you start talking about APIs as a product and you're looking at domains, then you, you start to look at your teams and you know are we aligned correctly through domains? Do we have the right um, talent in the teams, the right functional um, bits in there? And it's also led us to think harder on events. So similar to API first, we do have events here at Pexa. Um, but you know, taking that step back and looking at those domains and looking at APIs as a product um, makes us think about events as well. How, how, how can we do events in a, in a similar way, which has been really interesting. And then, of course, there's that long tail of getting everyone up to speed on API-first ways of working. Um, and you know, we have had some success there. I think we've, we've embedded and we've evangelized really well. Um, and in fact, in our last BRP session, our, our big room planning session, we had you know, a PO from a squad that we have embedded and evangelized in, put their hand up and say, hey, we, we can help other squads now in API first. So we're starting to see that snowball effect of, you know, we have our enablement team, but now we have other teams that have been enabled that are enabling other teams. So that that's, that's really fantastic to see. So we're definitely seeing a lot of traction now, which is great. And that um, just about wraps it up for us. Right. Great fun. Thank you very much, D uh, Dean and Shane. A uh, question we do have is around the living documentation, uh, and in particular, how um, Pexa is empowering the tech writers and contributors uh, to be able to keep pace with the product development. Did you want to hit that one, Shane? Yeah, so with the RC process, um, we have guardrails in place when it comes to actually um, making changes to the RFCs. So you just have to go through that pull request process and you have code owners specific to certain RFCs as well that get notified. And it means then they can actually um, have it a conversation and see where it actually fits within the guidelines and whether it actually aligns with the actual business values at PEXA. <clears throat> um, so that's the process that we've adopted. Brilliant. Um, I guess another one is is the role of a product owner is more of a business centric um, role traditionally. I guess how how key and critical has the product owners been in how much they need to understand from a technical viewpoint, or are they really just focused on the business side of things and what they want the API to achieve in terms of business outcomes? Yeah, I think that that's a really good question and. For us, you know, we, we have had to um, do a bit of work um, helping our product owners and product managers understand APIs. And I, I think 
APIs, the, the, they are a true product now, right? We, we do need our POs to, to understand what APIs are, how to, how to craft, you know, their domain. What, what do we want to expose out of our domain via APIs? And I think there is um, a focus of learning and development for us to, to make sure that we, we empower our, our POs and, and PMs to understand that. Yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a tricky one. Uh, and has becoming more API led seen you know uh, real world uh, improvements in the business processes around uh, conveyancing and, and the clearancing um, when it comes to um, settlements between uh, the financial institutions? Yeah, absolutely. We're seeing we're seeing more and more people wanting that that API channel. Uh, absolutely. Um, so, you know, making sure we have we have these beautiful composable APIs that people, uh, you know, our integrators can build upon um, is, is incredibly important. And we're seeing more and more um, that that want for, for APIs so that, you know, businesses can execute that much faster. Hmm. Brilliant. Well, I think we'll, we'll wrap that one up here. Uh, again, if uh, anyone has any direct questions for Dean and Shane, um, we, we have their details. You can reach out directly uh, to them after this. Uh, that takes us into the lunchtime break. Um, so before I go, just a reminder to visit the um, the vendor stores, so the um, uh, sponsor stores. Um, so our partners will have uh, trail and breadcrumbs uh, available for um, fulfilling the treasure hunt, which uh, you probably heard about at the beginning of today's session. So at each, um, each, each partner village store, there'll be a... Uh, opportunity to find the, uh, a clue to help with the treasure hunt towards the $700 gift card. So please go and visit the partners um, when you can. Otherwise, we'll be uh, taking a break now and we'll be back for the afternoon session, which will be kicking off uh, on the dot at 12.50 uh, with Dr. Omaru uh, Marantona, who's the CEO at uh, Aculus. So look forward to having that presentation and we'll see you in about an hour. Thanks, Ian. Thanks, Ian.